Hello, I'm Mary Staver, President of the Royal Neighbors Foundation. We're pleased you've joined us for today's webinar on practical budgeting for today's woman. Our foundation is a public charity dedicated to building women's futures through financial education. And through the foundation, we host several programs that support that mission, like the Build Your Worth grant that awards $1,000 to women pursuing a degree in a finance-related field. Currently, we're seeking candidates to be considered for our Know Your Worth grant. This award provides $10,000 to a deserving female entrepreneur. And to learn more about those programs and how you can get involved, please visit our website at www.royalneighborsfoundation.org. And just a reminder, all of these programs are made possible by the generous donations to the Foundation by individuals like you who believe in our mission. So a big thank you to all who contribute. Today, however, we're focused on financial education because at the Foundation, we understand that women's lives are filled with priorities. And the journey to building a strong financial future can be filled with questions and bumps in the road. And those can slow us down. So that's why we provide educational webinars that are geared to women and their unique interests and challenges. So let's get started learning more about today's event because it's a special one. We are very excited to introduce our new webinar presenter, Kristen Uretic. Kristen is a certified financial planner and co-founder of Brooklyn Plans, a New York-based financial planning company focused on helping people take control of their finances. She accomplishes this through developing individual plans and educating through webinars and workshops. And she also authors the blog, Young, Broke, and Awesome, helping to promote financial capability with thousands of millennials. Kristen's master's degree and background in education also complements her ability to transfer the skills and information. So please join me in welcoming Kristen Uretic to the Royal Neighbors Foundation. Kristen, how are you doing there in New York City? We're doing well. Thank you, Mary. It's getting cold here and getting to be uh, fully fall, and uh, I find that that's a good time for people to think about their finances as we come out of summer mode and start to be more internal and more um, looking to stay inside and think about things and reflect. So thank you so much for your introduction, and um, as the founder of Brooklyn Plans, we really value the collaboration with Royal Neighbors Foundation since our missions are so aligned to bring this types of information and access to the women of today. So thank you so much for having us. Um, we're very excited to be participating in the webinar today. And let's get started. Our objectives for today, as a former New York City teacher, I'm very big on learning objectives, are to understand the different components of a spending plan, to explore why traditional budgeting and expense tracking is flawed, to evaluate how a spending allowance system can apply to your life, and to practice calculating a daily, weekly, and monthly spending number. And this is the order we'll be addressing those objectives in. We're going to start with a little introduction and warm up. And then we'll review what traditional budgeting is and how it doesn't work for a lot of people. Um, we'll look at a new tool for you today, which is the spending plan, and then we'll talk about how you can create your own spending plan and get onto an allowance system. And we'll wrap up the, this presentation with some Q&A. So if you have questions throughout the presentation, please do um, go ahead and submit them to Mary, who will be collecting them. We won't be answering questions during the presentation for the sake of flow and getting through the content we want to deliver today but we will have time about 10 or 15 minutes at the end. So anytime you have a question, please feel free to go ahead and submit it so that um, yours is, is further up on the list by the time we get to Q&A and make sure we can address as much as we can. And as Mary said, I am Kristen Uredig. I'm a certified financial planner. I am the founder and women's wealth warrior here at Brooklyn Plan, based in Brooklyn, New York. And we provide um, various services for today's women, and as part of our collaboration with Royal Neighbors Foundation, we are offering this webinar as well as um, online content, and the Royal Neighbors of America, their sister organization, featured me on their magazine, so you can see there how this uh, collaboration is sort of 
spreading and uh, creating new new tools and media for, for all of you. So if you want to learn more about um, Royal Neighbors of America, as well as um, some women who have uh, been featured and me and my career, then you can head to their website and check out issue three um, from 2017 of the Royal Neighbor magazine. And I wanted to tell you a little bit about Brooklyn Plan. We offer three main services, investment management, personalized financial plans, as well as classes and events. So what you're participating in right now is one of our events. And we're able to bring this to you with the support of Royal Neighbors Foundation. You'll see here some pictures from live events that we've done and know that you are in good company today with all of the other participants on the line, even though you can't see them. Um, this is what it looks like when we do a live event and bring a bunch of people together to um, discuss and look at and participate in talking about and learning about um, financial tools. So let's go ahead and dive into our actual content. Here's a little introduction for you. Why are we talking about practical budgeting for today's women? And I get that question a lot in my uh, work as a financial planner dedicated to serving today's women. Uh, people ask me, why women? Why, why not everyone? And while we don't um, turn anyone away for based on gender, uh, we think that women have very specific needs. And that's not just something that we believe or that you can say in a sort of generalized or stereotypical way, that's something we can really see in the numbers. And here's an example. Um, in the BlackRock 2014 Investor Pulse survey, they found that 38% or closer to only a third of women feel in control of their financial future, compared to more than half, 55% of men. And I've often said that women have a confidence problem, not a competence problem. And we can tell that by the numbers that we see that women feel less comfortable and have a different relationship to money and managing it. So we're going to start off with our first poll question. And I do encourage all of you to respond. Um, this is our way of taking the temperature, learning about who's in the room, because the limitations of a webinar um, mean that we don't have as much opportunity to interact and discuss as we would in a live event. So this is our way of, of being able to check in and see where you guys are at and, and tailor the content a little bit to who we have in the room. So I want to know, you have about 30 seconds to answer this poll question before we'll get the results. And you'll see a little pop-up on your panel. How has your experience with budgeting been so far? So A is no experience. B is unsuccessful. C is somewhat successful and D is extremely successful. And there are no right answers. Go ahead and submit whichever one applies to you. This is just to see where you guys are at and um, where you're coming from, what experience you have with this topic so far. Okay, great, and I see the results coming in here. So it looks like we have a cluster around uh, B and C. This looks really kind of like a bell curve. We see the middle really clustering around B and C, unsuccessful or somewhat successful. And we have a few people that have no experience and a few people that have been extremely successful. And that lines up with what I've mostly seen with my clients and in other events that I've done. A lot of people have tried, um, but haven't necessarily considered themselves extremely successful with budgeting. Um, that's a common place to be. And for those of you that have um, no experience, this is a great place to start and good for you for, for logging on today and for getting some more information to get you started. And for those of you that have been extremely successful, then um, please do share with us your, your secrets for success because a lot of you have information that um, we'd love for you to, to be able to share with each other in your communities to help people that struggle with things that you may come more naturally to you. And we're glad that you're joining us. Hopefully you'll get something out of this new way of spending that you can also um, keep in your tool belt. All right, we've got another warm-up question for you, um, and you have another 30 seconds to submit your answers for this one. And in this one, we're asking you, what types of tools have you most recently used to track a budget? You may have used one of, more than one of these in your life, but most recently, what was the tool that you used to track or create a budget? A, pen and paper, B, Excel, C, 
an app or D other? So go ahead and submit your answers there. And while we're waiting for those to um, calculate, I'll just tell you that there's, again, no right answer here. And keeping track of a budget is more of, or, or having some sort of spending plan is more about a state of mind than it is a particular medium. And you can use different tools to create or track it. Um, the important thing is that you have a system for managing your cash flow and for living within your means by spending only the amount that's coming in and not overspending. Okay, so it looks like we do have results here, and wow, this is kind of a surprising one. Um, we have a lot of people using Excel, which um, is near and dear to my heart as a financial planner, but um, I'm, I'm surprised how many of you are using it. Um, and we've also got some people using pen and paper, a, a few people with other, and, and I'd say the one that comes in second is the app. Um, option and there are a lot of common ones coming out and continuing to come out um, every day it seems. And Excel is a great tool. It's very customizable. Um, it's a little clunky. Um, so we're going to look at what some alternatives are or how you can um, use a more effective and efficient way that doesn't require so much maintenance because Excel does require a lot of babysitting to keep up to date. So it's good to know where you guys are at and what experience you have, how you've been doing this, as we go forward with the content today. So thank you for participating in those. We're going to start by reviewing the elements of a traditional budget. And we're also just going to review, um, for those of you that have no experience or those that even have a great deal of experience, the basic components on a sort of technical level. What is a budget? What does it involve? What does it include? So a traditional budget involves these elements. One, income. That's the place that we have to start. We have to know what's coming in in order to plan for expenses. And normally, I'll point out, a budget is done on a monthly basis. There are cases or, or situations where you may need a weekly budget or an annual budget. For the most part, when we're talking about a budget or a spending plan, we're looking at a monthly basis. So what you need is your monthly income after taxes because that's what you actually have to work with. We don't really care about what your income is before taxes because you've got to pay those. And um, that's what we'll actually be using to cover the rest of your expenses in a given month. Two, second element of a traditional budget, expenses. Normally, in a traditional budget, you'll then list out anything that you would spend your money on in a, in a typical month from your rent to going out to shopping, it's all covered here in expenses. And the thinking goes that after you've spent your money, whatever is left will be your savings. And what we know from working with a lot of women and a lot of different people, this applies to everybody, is that it's very rare that we would have money left over because there's so many options for what we can spend it on. Um, besides the basics that we need, like rent and utilities or a mortgage if you're a homeowner, we end up finding no shortage of things that we can spend our money on. So this place that we're all trying to get to, which is savings, doesn't always happen for us which we'll see is one of the sort of downfalls of a traditional budget. This is the place we all want to get to and struggle to get to. And that's the whole reason I want to point out, too, that we're looking at this, is because we want to be able to save so that we can reach bigger goals. That's why we worry about our spending and we want to manage our expenses so that we can do other things that we really love to do. So the flaws with traditional budgeting is inflexible. There are fixed amounts, so we have to determine ahead of time how much we're going to spend on any given category, and there's very little wiggle room. It requires tracking, attention, and time. So if you have a given number, let's say 400 for dining out, and by the way, I should mention that these numbers may seem inflated to some of you coming from other parts of the country. Um, since we're based in New York, it's it's a very much an eat-out culture, so that's a common number that I would see in a, in a client's budget here, and that may vary based on where you live. Um, if that seems alarming to you, it, it's, it's not for us here. 
Um, but if you have a budget of, let's say, 400 for eating out in a month, um, then you'd have to track how many times you've eaten out, how much you've spent, and that's where a lot of apps and Excel and things like that come in um, for you to be able to know where you are in your category and in the limit that you've given yourself. Another flaw with budgeting, the amounts are a little arbitrary. Um, why 300 a month for shopping and 400 for eating out? It's um, there may be months when you spend nothing shopping and you eat out twice as much or half as much. So you have to sort of pick a number just to be able to track how you're doing uh, with each category that appears in your budget. And it's not super helpful as a practical, proactive tool. I find a lot of people use budgeting as a retroactive, reflective tool. At the end of the month, a lot of people will open up their budget and see sort of how they did, how they stacked up, how they performed for the month, and what happened, as opposed to using it as a tool to decide whether they should or shouldn't make certain purchases or incur certain expenses. Also, savings is not included as a line item in the traditional budget. It's an afterthought. It's the, if you spend the less than you make, you'll save, um, which, as we know, doesn't happen so easily. And it doesn't address variable income. For a lot of people that have side gig income or have are living um, on a freelancer's income or entrepreneur's income, it's very tricky to plan your expenses when you don't know what's coming in. And for those of us that have variable expenses, which is all of us, uh, it also doesn't track those how, it doesn't account for how we're going to cover something that is not a regular expense. For example, I just got a reminder that I have a, I have a nine month puppy and he needs another vaccination this month. So that wasn't, that's something I'm not going to include in my monthly spending plan because it's only something that happens once in a while. So the question arises, well, how do I cover that if that wasn't in my monthly budget? So, we talked about all the things we can spend on and all the ways that we can end up not saving in the traditional budgeting methodology. So my question for all of you is, what's your biggest spending week? Where does your money go when you notice that you're short? Is it on A, shopping, B, food and drinks, C, spending on others, whether that's kids or friends or family, uh, the other. So I'd like for you to go ahead and submit your answers in the poll question that you'll see in your panel. Where does your money go when it's when you have those moments where you realize you've spent too much? And I'll give you a moment to submit that. Okay, great. The results are in, and uh, we had a cluster around food and drinks and shopping. And I want to point out, it's kind of a stereotype that if people are overspending, they are spending it on shopping. Um, there's a lot of other ways that people end up overspending. It's not necessarily on shopping sprees. It, it may be shopping, and it may be, um, even if it is shopping, it may be on things that are important for those particular individuals to buy for their kids, for school, et cetera. Um, so we do see a lot of people, so it's not just us New Yorkers, that are spending on food and drinks. And then we also see a little bit um, of a cluster in, around C&D, but the, the bulk of people here today are all spending, overspending on shopping and food and drinks. Now I want to introduce you to a new way of, a new paradigm for you to manage your expenses that has some similarities with budgeting, but some very key differences as well. And we call this the Brooklyn Plan Spending Plan. It is something that we've developed and used in our work with clients that we found to be very successful. And we want to share it with you today and show you how you can try this system and methodology and apply it to your own life if budgeting hasn't been working for you. So the first step is the same. We still need to know, and again, on a monthly basis, your take-home pay. What are you taking home in a month? And this is an example of a real client who I have blurred out any identifying information of, of where she works. Let's call her Kate. 
And Kate has a main salary and she also has some side income. So she has a total take home pay of about 3,300 a month. The second part of the Brooklyn Plan Spending Plan is bills, which I expand to mean committed payments. I don't just mean here your cable, your internet, um, your heat. I mean everything that you've agreed to pay ahead of time. So that could be anything from subscriptions like Netflix or iTunes, the New York Times, other media subscriptions, to your student loan payments, your rent or your mortgage, any credit card payments that you have been required to make on a regular basis, your cell phone. Um, so I, this is an expansive way of looking at bills because you have already agreed to pay everyone on this list that we see in this example here of what Kate's monthly expenses are. You've already agreed to pay these people. So the money that is in your account is just visiting before it gets to these people's accounts who you have committed to pay on a regular basis. That could also mean a babysitter that you contract with and works a set number of hours each week. It could mean um, someone who comes by to clean the, the house on a monthly basis. Anybody that you agreed to pay consistently, a fixed amount regularly, would be in this category as far as the Brooklyn Plan spending plan goes. So we see here in Kate's case that she has about 1500 in her committed expenses. Now this is where it starts to get um, drastically different from a traditional budget. We then include savings as part of the expenses. So we, in this case, Kate is looking to accelerate her debt payment. So in addition to her minimum payments, she wants to make a $100 debt payment to get out of debt faster. And she's also going to save $50 to an emergency fund for a total of $150. So that's going to come out before we get to the spending money. So we reverse the order of where the savings is happening so that whatever's left after saving is spendable. And this is what we call the allowance. Now we have actual dedicated numbers per term. So we have a monthly number of $1,572, a weekly number of $363, and a daily number of $52. That's what is safe for her to spend. That is the money that she has control over and can determine where and how to spend it in the way that will last for her and work for her to get through the day, week, and month. And this is what I refer to as your magic number, your daily number. So knowing that you have enough to spend $52 a day, that's your magic number. And that doesn't mean that every single day you'll spend $52. It means some days you'll, you might spend 100 But you'll know that that was two days worth of your safe-to-spend money that you just spent, and you'll have to really pull back for the next few days in order to come out okay. So that number gives people a sort of bellwether for their spending and reduces the need to track every little expense. Because at this point, you have $52 a day or 363 a week. You can spend that money on whatever works for you. You don't have to track line item by line item. As long as you don't go over these numbers and you've already met your savings goal, then you are in the safe zone. With that spending money, you still have to cover a variety of expenses, which include your groceries, eating out. It's not that none of these things are needs. You've got to do your laundry. You've got to buy cleaning supplies. You've got to get around um, with auto and transport. So there, there's still some things that you would need to be able to do with this spending money. It's not just fun money, but these are things that you can really control and moderate in order to meet your spending limits. So again, what's the difference between a traditional budget and our spending plan? Summarize, I'll show you. A budget is one income minus two expenses equals three savings. The Brooklyn plan spending plan is one income minus two bills. So notice we've split expenses into two different categories, those that are, that are committed and those that um, you have control over where you're spending money. Minus three savings. So we've also switched the order of where the savings happens i.e. before spending, equals spending money. 
this here lays out the key differences in this very basic uh, equation that we've developed and how we would calculate savings and spending. That brings us to our fourth poll question. Since we're talking about saving, and as I mentioned earlier, that's why we're doing all of this, so that we can really save for things that we want to do in the future. What is your saving priority? Now that you've seen a new way to ensure that your savings happen, what are you going to be saving for? And obviously, you've got more than one thing you want to save for, but your priority, I'm asking you to pick one. You've got 30 seconds to submit your answers for this poll question. You have A, retirement, B, travel, C, a home, D, education, that could be for yourself or for a loved one, and E, other. So I try to pick the heavy hitters here that I typically see for reasons people want to save, but I may have missed something unique to you, and we have an other category to capture that. And a lot of my clients are interested in travel. I think retirement is one that we all hope to do one day. And home is something that a lot of younger folks are now looking at. Well, when I say younger, I mean 20s and 30s are looking at getting their first home. Um, and education is something that a lot of us that have kids are saving for, as well as those of us that want to go back to school, grad school, um, may need to save up for. All right, so we've got our results here, and I see that interesting, most of you are looking at B, travel, as your priority. So that is a, a great one, and that's more of a um, saving for the short to midterm, and we certainly want to balance that with savings for the long term, but it's a, a noble goal to have, and I think it's important to also enjoy the present and enjoy your life now, not just save everything for a far-off retirement goal. Okay, so now we are going to practice uh, with a spending plan and see how you can apply this to your life. So I'm going to ask you to take some notes. You could do that on your computer, your phone, grab a pen and paper handy. So I'm going to give you the steps that you'll need to take in order to create your own Brooklyn Plan spending plan and get yourself on an allowance and off of this very time and labor intensive budgeting system. So go ahead and grab something to take notes, and I will walk you through the steps. We won't have time for you to actually complete them right now, but you can take the notes so that you'll be able to fill in your numbers later and complete it at home. And I would suggest you do that tonight so that you don't lose the momentum. All right, here's the steps. Number one, you have to calculate your income. Again, this is monthly, and this is after taxes. You could get this information from your pay stub, looking at the net income number, or you could log into a bank account and see what's been deposited on a regular basis per month and total that up if you get paid twice monthly or weekly. Two is bills, so then you'll make a list of all your bills and committed payments. So you'll likely remember the biggest ones like your rent, your cell phone, and don't forget to also include odd ones that you may not think of subscriptions or think of as bills like Netflix, Hulu, your gym, anybody else that you may be paying to do services for you, your home, or your family, and include those in your committed expenses. I also included here a subway line. That's because a lot of People here in New York City buy a monthly subway card. So it's a fixed cost that people incur every single month, and it's um, always the same. And I included that because that can be a committed expense, but if that's not the case for you or you use public transportation occasionally, then that wouldn't apply. So you'll make a list of all of your fixed expenses that you've committed to make on a monthly basis and total those up. Then the third category is savings. You will add here any uh, debt payments you want to make above and beyond your minimum payments, any contributions to an emergency fund, 
or a freedom fund, which is what I like to call it when you're saving for things like traveling or things that you want to do because you enjoy them, which I think is a savings goal that's often overlooked, but very important because part of, well, the whole reason why we save is to really enjoy our lives. And so a freedom fund is a very noble goal to have to make sure that you're getting the most out of your life in the short to midterm and balancing that with long-term goals like retirement. So you'll get a sense of what you're able to save in a month and total that up for a savings total. Then you'll be able to know what your allowance is. And you'll find that out by doing one income minus two your bills minus three your savings. And that equals your spending money. So this is a very simple, none of this requires very advanced math. It's all stuff you can do very quickly on a calculator. And I'm sure a lot of you would, could even do it by hand. Um, but it'll, it'll be more efficient with your, with your calculator. So you'll do income minus bills minus savings to get your monthly spending money. And then from there, just divide it to get your weekly and your daily numbers. And that'll give you your magic number. That'll let you know what your safe to spend number is. And I find that number to be super powerful and informative beyond any given line item number in your budget. So that's how you would apply the spending plan to your life. And I want to take a moment to speak to variable income, which a lot of people are dealing with as the economy shifts. A lot of people are working on the gig economy or have freelance income or may have some component of a salary in in addition to a salary that's variable like commission or a bonus. So when you have variable income, it's very challenging to plug that into a spending plan because a spending plan by nature has fixed costs because your monthly costs are fixed, right? Your, Your landlord doesn't say, well, if you have a gig this month, then you can pay me more, and if not next month, pay me less, right? Your landlord needs the same amount every single month, as does the bank if you own a place. So when your income is variable, what I suggest people to do is to divide that up by percentages, because percentages will always work. Whether you earned $50 or $50,000, you can figure out what 25% of it is. And I have often recommended that my clients open up separate accounts, and in this case, I was recommending this client Capital One 360 for their savings accounts to divide up that variable income into various savings accounts. If you need your variable income to cover your fixed expenses, then this would look a little bit different. You would, instead of having all savings categories, potentially have 50% of your variable income to go into your expenses, Uh, your bills, and maybe 25% to your spending money. You'd have to play with that to see how much you're really able to live on and how much is coming in to see what the right allocation is for you. But I did want to speak to this because I always get this question from a lot of people that I work with in classes and in one-on-one sessions is, how do I budget if I have variable income? And the answer, the short answer is, percentages will make that a lot easier for you to have a predetermined allocation to different goals or spending money that you have. And that covers our content for today. And I know that you've been asking questions. I see some have popped up in the panel here. So I'm going to turn it over to Mary to field some of your questions and I will do my best to give you some answers um, for whatever your your burning questions are. Yes, uh, thank you, Kristen. And um, we do have some questions that are coming through that chat uh, capability, and we encourage our viewers to to do that because it really does help this content become more meaningful and personalized. So the first question we have is. Um, you know, when I'm putting a budget together, this, this viewer says, when I'm putting a budget together, um, there are a lot of ancillary expenses and spontaneous spends. Um, it, it would be great if I could track it on a mobile app. Do you have any suggestions with the kind of apps that are better um, than others? Thank you, Mary. That's a great question. I 
will first off give a disclaimer that this particular system is unique, the one that I've shown you today, and doesn't align super well with the existing apps because most apps are using a more traditional budgeting system. So they're doing the line item expense tracking. And what we've developed is a way for you to get away from that and just know what your daily, weekly, and monthly numbers are as opposed to keeping all the categories and subcategories straight in your head or app. However, I think it's a great idea to have an app that you can keep on the go to get give you a snapshot of, of where you're at and, and see what you have been spending on. It can be very informative. Mint is a website and app that I really think is powerful and um, have, have had a lot of success with. However, I know a lot of people feel overwhelmed with it. I've heard a lot of complaints from clients, so I'll, I'll give that disclaimer. It can be it, it has a lot of bells and whistles, which is great. Uh, it can be overwhelming if you're looking for something more simple. Social is an app that um, is more manual, so it doesn't, you don't sync your accounts to it. You have to use it and enter in all of your income and expenses manually, which in some ways can be more straightforward if you find that uh, an automated app doesn't accurately categorize things or you have trouble syncing with it. So Toshal is another one, as well as You Need a Budget or YNAB. That's a common and popular tool that I hear a lot of clients having success with. I've heard mixed results about apps in general, um, but those are, are three that are top of mind that could be helpful. Okay, and I think for convenience, we do have email addresses for all of our viewers, and so we can provide the names of those apps so that you have the specific um, a specific way to go out and, and, and view those um, in the app store. So, um, and then another viewer asks, um, there has, you know, a lot of the credit cards that this individual has, she says she gets a lot of points when she's spending um, using credit instead of, or plastic over cash, however, she has read in other resources where it's really better to use cash so you know exactly how much you're spending and you're more aware of it. So what are your thoughts on cash over plastic? I think that's a really good question. A lot of people have that question around credit card use and points and, and what the best way to go is. I'll say I'm not a fan of credit cards not just because of the interest rates, even for my clients that are paying in full. I find that it's confusing because of the fact that I can buy something today and, and not have to pay for it for another almost two months in some cases. And that allows my clients to not feel the impact of their spending in real time. I want my clients to see their bank accounts going down as they spend because that's reality. It's your spending, you should see that coming out of your account. So that's my my one of my issues with uh, credit card use. As far as cash goes, it's tricky because it's dangerous if you lose it or God forbid are robbed. There's no recourse where there is with a debit card. So I have to say I'm a fan of using debit cards, which will allow you to feel your expenses in real time, but still gives you the protection against theft or loss um, that the bank will uh, not fault you for any expenses that were not yours. Okay. Um, I'm going to paraphrase here because several of our listeners have asked this question in different ways. Um, but it seems like there is a theme around people who really want to do budgeting but have difficulty sticking with it. Um, do you have any suggestions for individuals who have that difficulty of trying to make those changes but just having trouble um, sticking with that budget and that commitment? I think it's a common one, uh, a common challenge that I, I hear expressed. So I'm, I'm not surprised that a few people have had that same one here today. And I've developed this system in the hope that it will address some of the problems that people encounter with budgeting and the sticking to it piece. Because traditional budgeting requires tracking and very careful attention to the numbers, 
that can be tiring and eventually if people decide to just kind of be more spontaneous. So this system is a way for people to just keep a very simple number in mind and I, I hope that it's much easier to stick to. And I would also say that it involves some behavior change and some sacrifice, but it's all for the benefit of you. So if you can keep in mind that it's so that you can save and that you can reach a bigger goal, I hope that that will be motivating and give you a little bit more energy to keep with a system and a commitment to yourself so that you can save and provide for yourself in the future. Yeah, I, I have to say, you know, in looking at your program, I think it's it's got to be helpful and maybe even comforting to whenever you're paid know, okay, I can take this much and this is how much I have to spend. It kind of gives you that sense of freedom that maybe that, that other method of budgeting kind of makes you feel more oppressed about. Um, so paying yourself first, that concept seems like it would be easier to stick to. I, thought, I found in my work with clients that it has been, and that's why I want to share it with others because I think there's a lot of stigma around budgeting and a sense of it being very deprivational, very disciplined, and I, I find this system more liberating and have gotten the feedback from clients that it's a game changer in terms of saving and spending. Okay, so I know, we know that you have your background in education and you were um, a school teacher, so you probably have homework for us. So I'm going to hand it back over to you for next steps. Well, you're absolutely right, Mary. You know me too well. So let's look at next steps and your homework. Um, first up is to finish your spending plan. Stick to it. And since you have the momentum of participating in this webinar, the only thing you have to do is wrap it up and make sure to fill out those steps that I gave you and calculate your numbers. Make sure it's realistic and accurate. So I always say that with financial planning, it's very much a tortoise wins the race situation. So if you haven't been saving anything and you are now starting to plug in savings into your spending plan, start slow. Start with 50 or $100 a month, um, and over time you can increase those numbers, but the more important piece is that you get into the habit of saving on a regular basis. And Mary mentioned this, and some of you had questions about this, stick to it. So there's different ways to stay motivated, and I think one is to find support through social media or an accountability partner who you can check in with regularly to make sure that you're on track and you can share your successes and struggles with. Because just like anything in life, it's a lot easier when you have help. Thank you, all of you, for participating and to Royal Neighbors Foundation for hosting and putting on this webinar. Please do keep in touch with Brooklyn Plans. We are online at brooklynplans.org. And you can find us on Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube at Brooklyn Plans, as well as on Facebook at brooklynplans.org. And we also have a closed Facebook group, Women Wealth Warriors, where we can support, collaborate, share, uh, vent, whatever it is about your finances. It's a safe space, and I encourage you to join that. And I will turn it back over to Mary to let you know how you can stay in touch with Royal Neighbors Foundation. Yeah, thanks, Kristen. So please visit our website and check out our reading room where we have financial topics and webinars to view. And for your convenience, today's webinar will also be available for your review uh, to go over some of the concepts that Kristen uh, shared with us. And finally, please watch for our next webinar to be air aired in January, How to Build a Solid Financial Foundation and Envision a Prosperous New Year. So really a good program to, to view, to get started and on the right foot as you plan your, your finances for that coming year. Uh, again, thanks for joining us, and until then, know your worth.